So chapter one is titled, How Did Marx Invent the Symptom? And in this chapter, Zizek begins by claiming that there is a structural similarity between the Freudian and Marxian modes of analysis. That even though Freud, as a psychoanalyst, was analyzing, say, dreams, and Marx, a political and economic philosopher, was analyzing, for instance, commodities, that the structure of analysis that each of these thinkers applied to their respective areas of study bears a striking similarity, one which presumably could also be applied to other areas, which is precisely what Zizek attempts to do in this book. He takes this structural, uh, this structured analysis, which he locates both in Freud and Marx, and begins to apply it to ideology. The title of the chapter, How Did Marx Invent the Symptom, is a reference to a somewhat obscure kind of offhand remark made by psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan in, in somewhere between 1974 and 1975 to, uh, during his 22nd seminar, where Lacan claims that it was Karl Marx who invented the notion of the symptom. Zizek acknowledges first that it's possible that this could be one of those, uh, you know, Lacanian quips that don't really have much meaning, that are kind of just, uh, you know, enigmatic for the sake of being enigmatic. However, he maintains that, you know, he thinks there really is some uh, value to this statement. And in fact, it seems to serve as the jumping off point for the remainder of Zizek's inquiry uh, in the rest of this book, but certainly in the first chapter, you know, particularly where, where he's comparing Freud and Marx in the first place. You know, that's what seems to have given him the idea to look for similarities in their modes of analysis at all. What exactly is this similarity? Zizek says this uh, on the first page of the chapter. In both cases, in both Marx and Freud, the point of analysis is to avoid the properly fetishistic fascination of the content supposedly hidden behind the form. The secret to be unveiled through analysis is not the content hidden behind the form, but on the contrary, the secret of this form itself. So here we have what Zizek calls a homology between Freud and Marx. That's how we know it's a structural similarity. Right, because the content Marx and Freud are dealing with is different. Freud is analyzing dreams, Marx is analyzing commodities, but the structure of the analysis that each of these guys apply to their respective areas of study has something similar about it. And that's a what a homologous structure is, is something in biology. And it has to do with uh, similarities between organisms. You know, the wings of birds, uh, the flippers of fish, for example. So there's something structurally similar about Marx and Freud. But when Zizek talks about uh, avoiding the properly fetishistic fascination of the content and the secret of the form itself, what, what exactly is the difference between those two things? What's the difference between the content hidden by the form and the form itself? Well, the first is a question of content, the other is a question of structure. You know, in the first question, we're asking about what's contained here. In the second question, we're asking how is it contained and perhaps why is it contained at all? So, for example, in dreams, Zizek writes, the theoretical intelligence of the form of dreams does not consist in penetrating from the manifest content to its hidden kernel to the latent dream thoughts. Rather, it consists in the answer to the question, why have the latent dream thoughts assumed such a form? Why were they transformed? Why were they transposed into the form of a dream in the first place? So here I think it's important to introduce a few terms that uh, Zizek defines a few pages later, um, which are three components to a dream from a Freudian psychoanalytic view. The mistake many people make, according to Zizek, is assuming that there is very much to be gained from only looking at two of these components. These being, in the first place, the manifest content, 
meaning the dream as it's articulated in a session, you know, so I'm telling an analyst what my dream, what happens in the dream. Uh, I'm telling them the, you know, the surface level stuff. And in the second place, there is the latent content, which I might be thinking is the solution to my problem. You know, the latent content is the, the hidden meaning of the dream, the what it symbolizes, what it means, what it represents. The problem, though, is in the first place, dreams are stories. Maybe they're convoluted and illogical stories, but they're stories nonetheless. Or at the very least, when we talk about our dreams, we are telling a story of sorts. And if we were to get to the so-called hidden meaning or the uh, what it refers to or what it symbolizes or something, well, really, that's just another story. Maybe we have a sense in which that's like the true story or the real story. The fact of the matter is, is that what analysis is looking for ultimately is not a story at all. It's actually much simpler, much more boring, but much more terrifying in many cases. Or at the very least, if not terrifying, you know, there's a reason it's covered up. What we're looking for in analysis or what analysis is supposed to be looking for uh, Zizek says, is this third component, which is the unconscious desire. At this point, I would say it's important to know something about Lacanian psychoanalysis, you know, which Zizek is clearly influenced by. And in Lacanianism, the so-called end of analysis, meaning the aim or goal of analytic uh, treatment, is to get at the truth of the subject's unconscious desire. For example, as Lacan points out in his um, 11th seminar, Four Fundamental Concepts of Psychoanalysis, he writes, well, he doesn't write, he says, the analyst is supposed to set out in search of unconscious desire. Desire is the axis, the pivot, the handle, the hammer, by which is applied the force element, the inertia, that lies behind what is formulated at first in the discourse of the patient as demand, namely the transference. So let's peel back some of that and get to the you know, essentials. The analyst is supposed to set out in search of unconscious desire. Desire is that which lies behind what is formulated in the discourse of the patient. What's the discourse of the patient? Well, the things they're saying, what they're telling, the analyst. And it is this desire that lies behind that. Uh, and it's unconscious, it's something that they're not, the patient's not aware of. The analyst isn't aware of it either. They're both trying to get to the, you know, that unconscious desire. That's the trick, isn't it? That's the challenge. The reason this is significant is because if you stop at the latent content, if you stop at some hidden meaning, some, you know, some story which you kind of arbitrarily determine is the true account of the dream's meaning, for example, you're still stopping at a story and you're not getting behind the desire which is covered up by the story. And you're certainly not getting to the question of why the desire was covered up in the first place. Why was this desire... Uh, repressed. To give you an idea of what I mean, consider a Matryoshka doll or nesting doll. You know, those little egg-shaped dolls that you, you open up the one and then there's another one inside and then you open up that one and, and it goes on like that until you get to this, the little tiny, uh, the baby at the center. One of my grandmothers had a set of these dolls. She was Ukrainian. And when I was a little kid, I remember playing with it once. And, you know, the first time you, you see one of those things, it's a very, very strange object. It's a very odd kind of process. You know, you're wondering, uh, you know, what's uh, what's under this one? You know, is this the last one? Does this one open up and, you know, eventually get to the center? When you're when you're playing with one of these things and you're opening up each successive doll inside a larger one, the question of, is this the last one or what's contained in this one? 
we're asking questions about content. What does the doll contain? At some point, I, I assume I got a little bit bored of that because you kind of figure out, you know, you figure out the whole deal, you know. And I start asking questions like, why is this little tiniest doll covered up by all these other ones in the first place? You know, I mean, what's the point? You know, maybe I thought that the goal, that there was a goal, and the goal was to get to the little baby doll at the center. Then I start thinking, well, why is it hidden in the first place? What's the purpose of this? There's no challenge. There's no game. It doesn't require skill. Why is, why is the little baby hidden underneath all the other matryoshkas? At that point, I'm sort of getting away from questions of content, but I'm not quite removed yet. But what I am approaching is a question not of content, but of form. I really don't get to the question of form, though, properly speaking, until we first consider the answer someone might give that question. You know, why is the little doll hidden? At least the surface answer to that question, which is basically, uh, at least originally, the dolls were intended to represent uh, the mother. That's what matryoshka means. It means little mother, little matron. It represents the mother holding the child inside of her carrying it in her womb. In other interpretations, the each doll kind of represents like another generation. That's one way of looking at it. And of course, there's all this cultural stuff like they're, you know, uh, they're painted in a, you know, very elaborate, beautiful way. That's part of it too. But there is this sense in which the doll is supposed to kind of represent, you know, motherhood and, and carrying the child in the womb. This kind of answers the question, you know, it answers the question in so far as it confirms, yes, this isn't really a game of skill. You know, it's not supposed to be challenging. It's just kind of fun and interesting. And it, it also conveys a, a fact about human life that, you know, that's where babies come from. You know, mom carries her or the child in their inner womb. And, you know, you discover that when, uh, when you're older. You discover the mechanics of all that when you're older, which is proper. That's correct. But isn't that interesting that that's sort of um, that's sort of hidden in plain sight, isn't it? This uh, fact of human life and where humans, you know, come from is concealed, but not concealed in the Matryoshka. And that's from a Lacanian perspective, the truth of the of the nesting doll, the, the capital T truth really is the fact that something has been concealed without concealing it really. And why? Why is that? Here's the, the heart of the matter. Because on some level, the parents want the kid to know you didn't really come from a stork. You didn't, you know, whatever other stories parents tell kids. Um, you know, there there's something else that goes on that you exist now. But we don't want you to know that yet. We just kind of want you to have it in the back of your mind. That's very often what happens at the end of analysis. The truth turns out to have been hiding in plain sight all along. Of course, we never say that something is presently hiding in plain sight. That wouldn't make sense. No, it's only after uncovering it that we say that. It's only after we go through our own kind of Matryoshka-like process of opening one thing, thinking, aha, this is it. But then turns out you uncover that and there's something underneath it. If analysis were nothing but uncovering hidden content, then analysis would not be much different from playing with a matryoshka. Rather, in analysis, the aim is not to get to the little secret at the center, you know, like in a dream. That's not what gives us the truth in the Lacanian sense. It doesn't give us our unconscious desire. Instead, what does is the secret of the form of the dream, meaning the reason the dream takes shape in the first place. And that always comes down to this unconscious desire, a desire which would like to remain unconscious, but not totally shrouded in darkness. You know, hidden, but not hidden. Concealed, but not concealed. You know, thus it takes the form of a dream. It conceals itself, 
with layer after layer of meaning and symbolism. And when we're chasing after those possible interpretations and possible meanings and possible what it refers to and so on, we are, oh, there's my first and so on of the video. What we're doing is we're really uh, chasing after red herrings, you know, to use the the trope of mystery novels, you know, tracing after something that seems like the, the object of our quest, but really it's just a distraction, just another story. All the while, the desire which formed this dream remains elusive until at last an analysis is able to probe it and we cry out, you know, whatever the desire happens to be. Basically, the idea isn't that we just want to evade the truth. You know, it's not that stereotypical, oh, you're in denial kind of thing, which, I mean, that's a reality sometimes. There's some things we want to deny, but unconscious stuff, it's kind of hard to deny something you're unaware of. How can you be compelled to admit to something that you don't know? Can't deny something you're unaware of, can't admit to something you don't know. That would belie the very definition of unconscious. But following after the elaborate means by which our unconscious desire hides in plain sight, we often end up playing a game of hide and seek with the very people who could help us uncover that truth. Because there's a reason it's covered up. The real truth, interestingly enough, is almost always something very simple. And for one reason or another, painful to acknowledge. There's a great scene in the film Rocky III, which I think exemplifies this idea very nicely. The scene I'm referring to takes place on a beach between Rocky and his wife, Adrian. And in this scene, Rocky takes the form of, takes on the role of the, the analysand, a particularly stubborn analysand. And Adrian assumes the role of the analyst. And the way in which their conversation proceeds is, is so interesting. See, the last few years, Rocky has been defending his title against these rather weak opponents that his trainer, Mickey, has set up for him. So there's kind of this sense of fraudulence kind of in the background. On top of that, this new young rising star, Clubber Lang, played by Mr. T, seems to pose a significant threat to Rocky, who's you know, holding the world championship title at the moment. And then when his mentor dies, uh, Rocky is just, you know, falls into complete despair. So he goes, uh, goes to the beach to, you know, fall into despair. When Adrian finds him, the first thing she says is, I want to talk to you about something important and I want you to tell me the truth. She makes it very clear. She wants him to tell him the truth tell her the truth. But I wonder if the writer of this scene was familiar with Lacanian psychoanalysis, because at several points, the dialogue could have reached its climax, you know, because Rocky proceeds to tell her what he thinks she wants, the truth. Except at each juncture, each time he offers her another thing which he thinks is the truth, whether it's the the, the admission that he blames himself for his mentor's death, whether it's the uh, confession that he doesn't want to lose what he's got, so he doesn't even want to try, whether it's the, you know, the sense of fraudulence, you know, those fights weren't real, he says. Each time he says stuff like that, Adrian says, I want the truth, damn it. I don't want that. I want the truth. I mean, Rocky even does the whole Chevois thing. He says, what, what do you want? What do you want from me? Which is, you know, totally Lacanian. I mean, that's even the title of, of one of Zizek's chapters in this book. You know, what do you want? Well, she wants the truth. What is the truth? What is the climax of that scene? The truth is, as Rocky famously says, I'm afraid. For the first time in my life, I'm afraid. See, the truth at the end of an analytic encounter is always simple, and it's almost always connected to what some Lacanians call the biological real, you know, something that reminds us of our fleshy form, of our mortality. But when we get to the real truth, the reason 
that Rocky has covered up his fear in the first place goes even deeper. And this is the, you know, big T truth in the Lacanian sense, which is that he doesn't like fear. He doesn't think he should be afraid. He doesn't even seem to think that he is like other people, which is why Adrian reminds him, you know, you are human. Did you, you know, don't you know that? He doesn't understand fear. He doesn't like it, which is Adrian's cue to move the analysis toward a conclusion. You see her calm down as soon as Rocky gets his most emotional. But that's not what makes that the climax of the scene when Rocky yells, I'm afraid. It's the climax of the, it's, it's, he's emotional because it's the climax of that analytic encounter because he's finally getting to the source, to the real core issue that underlies all this other stuff that has covered it up. Pay attention to the things that he gives Adrian as offerings, you know, you know, I'm giving her what she wants. You want the truth. This is the truth. But she strikes it all down. Notice what those, what all those things are that he gives her. They're all stories. They're all true stories. You know, it's true that he blames himself for his mentor's death. Maybe it's not true that he's responsible, but it is true that he blames himself it's not true that the fights he was in weren't real, but it's true that he feels that way. It's not true that he's going to lose everything he's got, but again, true that he feels that way. It, the point is that it's not, she doesn't tell him these aren't the truth because they're lies. There's another option. They are true, but they're not the truth. And that's what happens a lot. You know, I do this with people all the time where they ask me, what's wrong? What's bothering you? And I might throw out all these things that I think are the, the answer to that question. Truth of the matter is, I don't really know the answer to that question either, which is why there's this guessing game, this hide and seek. But when we get down to brass tacks, when we get down to the core of it, it's almost always something very simple, like in Rocky's case, where he's experiencing the very normal human emotion of fear, which itself is terrifying to him. And the conclusion, therefore, of this encounter is, you know, the, the interpretation that Adrian, as analyst, offers Rocky is to explain to his stubborn ass that he can still be a big macho man and experience fear, that it's okay to do both, you know, and, and that he's human, you know. And the analysis concludes with this beautiful moment of, trans, of transference where Rocky, who you know, identifies so much with his physical strength, recognizes the emotional strength in his wife, who then tells him that the reason she has that strength is because of him. Wonderful, you know, the transference, it's great. But, you know, a lot of us, I think, believe that the way to the truth, you know, so the way to the answer to whatever problem it is we're trying to discuss to get to the secret is by analyzing that surface level content, which never ends, just like the, the doll, it just keeps going and going. And even when we reach that little thing in the center, we're still not answering the question of why was this hidden in the first place? We just get another story. We don't get to the heart of why we write the story in the first place, which entails that we uncover the unconscious desire which has structured the dream and all its layers of content and drama around itself.